The Old Gold Club. Powered by Wolverhampton Building Supplies. With Mikey Burrows and Chris Iwalumo. Welcome along to the Old Gold Club. I'm Mikey Burrows, alongside me, Chris Awellamo, and our guest this week spent five years at Molyneux between 1972 and 1977, making over 150 appearances and scoring 31 goals. The man affectionately known as the Tank. Welcome <laughs> to the Old Gold Club, Steve Kinden. Thank you, Mikey. It's brilliant to have you back. I love that nickname of the Tank. Yeah. Because you've just been telling us that you played football like you played rugby. Mm -hmm. Is that where that came from? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. The physicality. Yeah, absolutely. Because you had more than just that nickname, though, didn't you? You had, uh, I've seen other nicknames for you, included Skippy, mm -hmm. The Horse. Mm -hmm. let's, not get, let's not get into that one now. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one to have. And um, is this true that apparently a commentator at the time called you a runaway wardrobe? It was Stuart Hall. And my mum was going to sue him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was just a, 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 he, he paraded down the wing like a runaway wardrobe. It was just a comment he threw out, that was all. Kendall, you said earlier uh, about uh, you weren't the most as technical of no, players. absolutely So, not. going into matches, because you, sc hey, you scored goals. It's the hardest oh, thing yeah. to do in football. Uh -huh. Would you go into a match thinking, I can bully this, I can bully, I can use my attributes to bully it, to then create for others as well? Would that be a strong point? Obviously, we want to go into matches, score our goals, and and take the credit for it. But how would you how no. would you approach football matches? No, I, I I would never go into a game intending to bully. I was never that sort of personality. I was the I I, I was the protector. Right. Okay. I grew up rugby, and I was a far better rugby player than ever I was a footballer. And I was the rugby player who never got his shorts dirty because I was the, the three-quarter who would run past people because I was very fast. I had a great sidestep and a good handoff and I'd, I'd get the tries. But when it comes to physicality at rugby, I mean, it's changed now, but in the main, it was the eight forwards and the eight forwards protected the superstars. That right, okay. I always remember Will Greenwood, the World Cup winner in 2003. He'd got a hat trick at Twickenham and he was being interviewed. And, and how about this try, Will? And what about this? And Will said, Oh, hold on, love. It's the forwards that win the game. The backs just decide by how many points. <laughs> so I took that physicality because I wasn't, I was a, I was a big lad, but not compared with rugby forwards. When I went to football, the human frame is smaller, and so I was a bigger footballer. Yeah. And I used to protect the smaller lads in the team, and I'd, I'd have a quiet word sometimes, very often actually, with centre-halves. And I'm not against a good hard 50-50 challenge, I'm not <laughs> against a, a good rugurous tackle, but I'd say to the big ignorant center hours like Sam Allardyce or whoever, any nasty business, if, if one of my forwards but gets... That, that was part of the game though. I, I remember when I first came through and when aye. the goalkeeper came to claim the ball aye. and the manager would have a go at you for saying that's your chance to take, a good, to take a good yellow. Correct. And they'd be disappointed because then that puts the, the keeper on edge mm. anytime he's coming out. So... I'm surprised that you've said, or oh, you're more the protector, that you know what's coming. You know that the likes of whoever it's, you, you said Sam Allardyce there, who was a very physical only, player. Only in the first eight months of my career, because I, I dished out more in retribution than they gave me. So they, After they, they started it? I, I, <laughs> so they wouldn't do it again. In the return fixture, or the next season's fixture. Yeah. Oh, I didn't mind rigorous tackling. You just mentioned the goalkeeper there, you know. Um, I made my debut at West Ham, at West Ham. It was just a throwaway game at the end of the season. The following season, I made my home debut, and by coincidence, against West Ham. Yeah. And the, the idea of the team tactical talk for that week was, this is 1968, two years after we've won the World Cup final. Uh, right, Steve, you're going to be marked by, you're, you're going to mark Bobby Moore. If the centre-half tries to stand, go and stand by Bobby Moore. Make sure Bobby Moore's on you. Right, lads, just knock it over the ball. Bobby Moore had every talent in the world, <laughs> he except yeah. 
he he was a bit slow on his feet. Yeah. His mind wasn't. So. Yeah. Fabulous defender, but he couldn't run very fast. So we won the game 3-1. My home debut, I scored a goal, and I'm marked by Bobby Moore. And the next game was at the Victoria Ground Stoke. <laughs> and the team talk was, right, as soon as we can in the game, lob a ball up uh, under the crossbar for Gordon Banks to catch. Steve, push him into the net. That's it, Go yeah. and body charge him into the net. So we won the game 2-0. And the next game, we were at home to Leeds United. Right, the game plan is, Steve's going to be on Jack Charlton, who can't run, and just knock over the ball. The great Leeds United side of the late 60s, Gary Sprake, Paul Reaney, Terry Cooper, Billy Bremner, Norman Hunter, Jack Charlton, Peter Lorimer, Johnny Giles, Alan Clark, and the other two, Eddie Gray, <laughs> Eddie Gray, and the big centre forward. Um, Mick Jones. Um, we beat them 5-1. So that's my first, after the, tra you know, bit of a game the previous, that's my first three games. Yeah, brilliant. And I said to the gaffer next week, I said, boss, you just had me against Bobby Moore, Jack Charlton and Gordon Banks. Two years ago, they won the World Cup for England. Brilliant. How come I, he says, well, the Germans didn't have anybody with your pace and power. You've been, yeah, you've been far too modest. I have to say though, in '72, Wolves come in for you. Yeah. So, talk yeah. to me about that. What, okay. what, what happened in that when it came up? What was your your knowledge of of Wolves at that moment? Very little. A, a little bit of a funny story. I hope I don't un insult anybody, <laughs> any Wolves fans. I, I, I was, I just got married. I, I got married in about. 11 days earlier and it's the summer months it's June and I've picked up I'm, I'm, it's a holiday so I've picked up my morning paper and the headline is that Frank Worthington was going to sign for Liverpool but he's failed his medical so Liverpool have pulled out of the transfer and of course the manager was Bill Shankly but an hour later I've met, read my papers a knock on my door and it's the chief scout of Burnley Stephen get a suit on, there's somebody at the club down to see you. Well, at Bur Burnley were a selling club. They, they sold their, quote, best player every year to make the finance, you know, small, yeah. small crowd and all that. They did very, very well. So you know it's a transfer, somebody's at the ground to see you. So he said, so I'll, I'll see you down there, Dave. No, the manager wants me to take you. All oh, right, okay. So we waited, but in the car, this is how it was, to a certain extent, there weren't any agents, and to, I'm 21 year old. Yeah. And I sat next to this guy, who is it, Dave? I'm not at liberty to tell you. <laughs> I said, oh, thanks, Dave, it's my future, and you can't. So we got, we pulled up outside Turf Moor, and he jumped out the car, and Jimmy Adamson was the manager, and he said to the chief scout, Dave, Bill's in the director's room, I'm taking Stephen into my office for a quick chat to him. I thought, oh, Bill, it's Bill Shankly. He's not gone in for, you know, he'd been let down with the medical for, I thought it was Bill Shankly instead of Frank Worthington. I was going to Anfield and I went into the manager's office and he said, I've got Bill McGarry next door. I said, oh, is he chief scout for, Bert, for Liverpool? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I knew who Bill McGarry was. But, you know, it's just a coincidence I'd, that he hadn't told me, and I just thought, it's Liverpool, and then, of course, Bill McGarry, it's Wolves. Brilliant. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. So is this you admitting now, Steve, after all these years, that you didn't actually want to come to Wolves in the first <laughs> place? <laughs> this is outrageous. I never said that. Wolves wanted me. You know, in those days, again, you didn't have an agent. You didn't agitate to get a transfer. But it proved, if they're willing to listen to an offer, it proved to me that Burnley... I'm not saying didn't want me, but they'd rather have the money. Yeah. And Wolverhampton Wanderers did want me. What happened in, this is the summer of 72. In the January of 72, Wolves played Burnley at Turf Moor in an FA Cup, final, a, a, FA Cup tie, third yeah. round. And I had a great game, a, a, a really exciting game. I played really, really well. And Burnley beat... Uh, Wolves in the FA Cup 72 and 
apparently, I learned years later, Bill McGarry told me, I made a bid for you then. I wanted you straight away then. Right. But uh, Jimmy Adamson said, no, we'll need him till the end of the season. You can have him in the summer months. Because when you arrived, you joined a team that had just been in the UEFA Cup final. Yes. And lost to Spurs. Yes. Um, and had two of the most iconic forwards this football club's probably ever had. It. Yeah. And that, certainly at the time of Derek Dugan and John Richards already. Kingdom. And there was a, an awful lot of competition, and especially in what because you could play wide as well. Yeah. But then you had Waggy out the wide as well. Well, something remarkable, in my opinion, happened. Um, in our day, it was a seven-page contract. I'm at Turf Moor. I've agreed the terms with Bill McGarry, and I've signed seven pages of a contract. And as soon as he saw me, it was subject to a medical. I had to drive up to Molyneux for a medical the following day. And as soon as I signed the contract, he looked at it, yeah, it's all signed. He said that he paid £110,000 for me, a record transfer fee ever paid by Wolves at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And he looked at me, he said, right, Steve, he said, uh, you won't be playing much this season. I said, why not? And he, he quite rightly said, although I, I wish he told me before I signed, uh, you, well, you can play centre forward or left wing. Yeah. Well, I've got a centre forward called Derek Dugan and he's better than you. <laughs> oh, thanks, boss. <laughs> and I've got a left winger called Dave Wagstaff and he's better than you. It's not bad when you've just signed a contract for 110000 Yeah, welcome to Wolves. So I said to him, well, why have you signed me? He said, they're both the wrong side of 30. Chris will tell you, when yeah. you're 22, when you're 18, you get a dead leg, you're fit. You, you play, you, you're running again within two days. Yeah. When you're 32, you're out for two weeks, you know? So that first get season, I think I'm right. I'm only one out. I played 27 games in the first season. Unfortunately for me, it was like half at left wing and half yeah. at centre forward. I think that was league in all the pit, in all, all appearances, yeah. 30, cup, cup as well, 36. 36. Was it 50, 36 was 15 it? a sub though, that was the thing. Yeah, sure, sure. It was very disconcerting. And I've got, I've got the video at home actually. We played West Ham away and we drew two all. And I scored both goals with runs from my own half. I just straight through like the tank. And I've scored both goals. I didn't play in the following week. So in that, you're talking about your first season and the manager saying to you mm. that you might not you might not play as much. Mm -hmm. You're a young player. You're probably playing week in, week out at Burnley. Aye. How difficult is that? So you come in, 36 appearances, five goals, scoring your debut against Newcastle. Newcastle yeah. So so how, how do you deal with that then? How, how would you say your first season was, return, return wise? It, it, once I'd got over this shock of not being as much wanted as I thought I was, yeah. it was okay. And unfortunately, I don't want to be critical of the manager, but in 1972, it was right. By 1974-75, it was wrong. I was a better player than both of them by then. I was 24, 25, they were 34, 35 sort of thing. Yeah. And even when they were fit, but he had it in this mentality, Steve's a great substitute. Because your second season, um, your kind of appearances drop right down mm -hmm. and you also miss the run to the League Cup final yeah. that year. When we yeah. had Steve Daly in, and kind of he was in a similar position yeah. as well. And it kind of, you could tell that it wasn't something that he, he still kind of rankled with him even now. Does it for you as well? The only thing about the League Cup that rankled with me in the week prior to the final, he, he called us all into the room one by one. Um, Sammy, it was quite comical. Sammy Chung's in the dressing room saying, that, Gary, Gary Pierce, uh, manager wants you in the office. And it's just to say, you're playing. And he's come back like that. And, uh, Jeff, Jeff Palmer, the manager wants you in the Derek, so one by one, yeah. they're all going to. And I, I was called into his office and he guaranteed me that I'd be sub. 
and then near nearer to the cup final, Alan Alan Sunderland got a slight tweak of a hamstring. So because of that worry, he made he he told Barry Powell he, he Barry was sub. Yeah. And the thing is, he never told me personally. He just we were all together three or four hours before kickoff. He said, right, lads, you'll know the team. And with Alan having a bit of a hamstring, I'm making Barry Powell my sub. And I can remember everybody looking at me in the dressing room, in the hotel room, because we all knew I was going to be sub and I wasn't even sub. That was terribly disappointing. Did you still go to the game? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Were you, where were you watching it? With, with Phil Parks. Lofty, because Lofty was injured. Were you kind of allowed down onto the bench? Or no, did you have no, to watch no. it from the stands? From the stands. With See, that wife. must have been so hard. Tell me about it. Yeah. She had a few tears there. Are you over it, though? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I wish I'd played, of course. Yeah, of course you did. But um, it, I'm over everything. I'm an old man. <laughs> I'm over everything. Um, it, it was a great <clears throat> period of my life. Chris will tell you there's ups and downs. Course, that was, was, that yeah. was a dreadful down. The, the one thing about Bill McGarry, uh, and it's happened before, um, uh, in 19, I can't say it, but in 1966, Alf Ramsey picked a team that suited the English conditions and he invented the wingless wonders. We had, we had Ian Callaghan and, and Terry Payne and John Kennelly in the 22 players, all wingers. Yeah. But he, he went with wingless wonders, they call themselves, <coughs> with Alan Ball doing a bit and Martin Peters doing a lot and, and all that. Wingless wonders. Four years later, in the humidity and the heat of Mexico, he played the same system. And three years later, he got, he got the sack because he hadn't moved with the times. He'd stuck loyally to his World Cup winners for too long. Yeah. Um, Don Revy at Leeds United built up a fabulous team, and it wasn't just a team because there was Terry Hibbert, there was there, there were other players, Rod Belfit, that were uh, Terry Yorath, that were wonderful in the squad. Yeah. But he stuck with that team, and then when he disappeared to manage England, Jimmy Armfield inherited a team that was basically all over 30 year old. Liverpool never did that in the same era. Liverpool evolved, brought in one or two players every year. Yeah. England got all together. Leeds United got all together. When I joined this club, I'd, I'm, I'm not knocking these players in any way, shape or form. <laughs> but in the side, when I joined the club was Bernard Shaw, over 30. Yeah. Danny Hegan, over 30. Jimmy McCallyog, over 30. Derek Dugan, over 30. Dave Wagstaff, over 30. Mike, did I say Mike Bailey? The captain, yeah. over 30. In 1972, great. Let's win a League Cup. 1974, let's qualify for Europe. When it gets to 1975 and 1976, all of a sudden it's not just over 30, the 33, 34, 35. And we got relegated. I was going to touch on that. You talk about there is lots of ups, there's downs Aye. in football. So obviously 75, 76, get mm. relegated from Division 1. So yeah. what went wrong? Obviously you're talking about the, the balance, maybe with the, the ageing squad, that they maybe not evolving and bringing in the young talent and adding that one and two players. So we, is, is we, that a main, was that one of the main issues then? We had the young talent. Just not using just not Barry Powell, Steve Daly, Alan Sunderland, Jeff Park. Well, Jeff got into the side on a regular basis, but they were all there, and yeah. we knew, we absolutely knew when we went down that we were too good to go down, and we went back the following season as champions. Mm. But it, it just, you can call it loyalty, you can call it a little bit short-sighted, a little bit blinkered, call it what you will, he made, I think he made a mistake. And by hell, if there was one lad who wasn't playing regularly that was chomping at the bit, that was me. Yeah. 
What, what would you what would you, what would you put that down to then? Because obviously a manager, he has experienced professionals that have been there and done it. <laughs> They're also a voice in the dressing room. You lose one of them, it can also poison the rest of the group, isn't it? So as a manager, you have to manage these players, but still, the players have got to understand that there's young talent there that probably deserve to get the chance. You know, when I came to Wolves, you know, they brought in Sam Vokes. We had Mick yep. McCarthy on here. Yep. Uh, and uh, he, he spoke about players being ready and uh, being able to learn from the players that are ahead of them. But there is, comes a time when they take the mantle, don't they? Absolutely. And what, so why, why, why would you, why, what was it, what was his reasoning then? Because these players were good, good footballers, good professionals. They delivered more so, but yeah, they were aging. They would, they would miss games when sure. But where was, was that probably a fear that he didn't want to upset them too much? He had to kind of keep everyone happy no. as all managers probably try and do now. It's probably the hardest thing to no, do. No, Bill McGarry was a distant manager. Yeah. We very rarely spoke to him socially. He was a distant manager and he was a powerful man. And to me, to a certain extent, a little bit frightening. I right. don't mean physically. I don't, you know, he, he didn't make friends easily, sort of. But thing. he had the respect to the... the, the oh, dish. yes. Yeah. His knowledge of football was absolutely supreme. Yeah. We'd, we'd train in a certain manner. I'm making it up now. 4 2 4. And within five minutes, he's seen how the opposition is playing and he sent a message down and we're changing it. And we could change it. We were good players. But. So I don't think he owed a friendship to Jimmy McCallagh or, or Danny Hegan. I don't think he owed a friendship to Derek Dugan or Dave Wagstaff. It's very, very difficult. If, 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 <laughs> if you've got a car and it's brand new and you love that car and five years later you still love that car and eight years later it starts to sound a bit funny you still love that car don't you and you want to keep yeah. that car and you really know you should have got a new one two years before and it could be similar to that Jimmy McCallagh I, I keep saying Jimmy I could say Bernard Shaw I could say Danny Hegan I should say Doug Waggy Mike Bailey fabulous player Mike Bailey but there comes a time in every, every car existence, there comes a time in every player's existence when they're not quite as good as they were six months earlier. Yeah. They're not quite as good as they were a year earlier. Yeah. And six months after that, now they're struggling. But if, you, if they've done it for you before, we used to, we have a, I can remember having a training session and, uh, you know the route where you just pass it 10 yards and go round the back and you pass when it's yeah. your turn yeah. it's just a, the ball going back and forth and it's just one touch you just pass it go round the back pass, when it's your turn again Danny Hegan he used to he used to chip it up get on his knee and do a little trick with it that none of us dare do because it's one touch you're not allowed to do that you've been to, and Bill McGarry would stand there saying Great, Danny, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Danny Hegan, uh, George Best was obviously ghostwritten, but it, uh, a book, uh, they played together for Northern Ireland, and, yeah. da and, and uh, George Best once was quoted as saying the most skillful footballer he'd ever seen was Danny Hegan. Brilliant. He was a great footballer. But um, he'd had his, I don't, it, it passed his cell by day. Had his day, yeah. Aye. Yep. Comes to us all. We, the, as you mentioned kind of earlier, there are skillful footballers. Mm -hmm. You were a very fast footballer. Mm -hmm. um, you ran the 100 metres mm -hmm. in 10.7 seconds. Done your research, haven't you? I have done my research, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. We're not just coming to this off the fly here, Steve. <laughs> um, and I, I looked it up, you know. Yeah. That is only, I think, 0 0.8 hundredths of a second off the world record 100 metres time at the time you the, were that fast the you Brit could have competed at the olympics the british record was 10.4 when so i that's when i when i ran 10.7 my brother represented great britain in athletics at the high hurdles 110 hurdles and uh, my brother's malcolm he never ever could beat me in a flat race he could hurdle better than me but in a flat race he never beat me and it did me a power of good coming to Wolverhampton in one respect because in the summer months, because big lads 
tend to put a little bit of weight on. <laughs> well, we all accept that, Steve, around this table. So I used to play uh, an awful lot of tennis with Alan Sunderland. We used to love, in the summer months, I, I used to play a game of squash every week with Bev Bevan. The drummer from the Move yeah. and the Yellow. Oh yeah, Bev and I, great pals. Love this. Yeah, and then um, I, in the summer months, every Tuesday, I'm sorry, every Thursday evening, I went to, um, oh uh, good Lord, I've forgotten the name of the track, Wolverhampton and Bilston. Yeah. They have an athletics track. Right. I've just forgotten what it's called. But I, I was training there. And there was a, the second best 400 meter runner in the country, Glenn, was it Glenn Cohen? No, I'm sorry. Anyway, I'll remember. And we used to train together because I needed, I, I, no good me training for 50 yards or 100 yards. I, could, I, needed, I needed to improve my stamina. Yeah, so we I used to train with this 400 meter runner and we'd do a 300 meter run and then stop 400 meters around the track, not stop, th run for 300 meters fast, and then walk for 100 meters to back to the start, yeah. and then run again and do a series of 10 runs. Yeah. And at, at the end of every session, Glenn and I had a race just to, and whenever it was less than 300 meters, th this lad was a international. David yeah. Jenkins, the big blonde lad, he was the best in the country at the time. And and I used to if if it was anything three if it was less than three hundred meters our final race I'd always beat him. If it was more than three hundred meters he'd always beat me, and it was a three hundred meter mark where it was on the night. <laughs> well, you were the fastest footballer in in England. And until time. recently, I was the fattest ex footballer. Because <laughs> <laughs> you had, because um, wasn't there, like, there was proper competitions, proper races. Yeah, you had to go to Edinburgh, to Meadowbank Stadium. So was it like one person from each club? No, no, no. Uh, the, every year the club would get a letter. Um, we're holding this competition. If anybody wants to enter, please feel free, let us know. So, yeah. So when you went up there, like, did you have to run in football kit? Oh, no, no, no. No, I couldn't. <sighs> what, 10.7 in my football boots? No, no, no. It was a proper, it wasn't a, an athletics meeting like you might see in the Olympics because it was um, in Scotland. And they're funny up there, aren't they, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> it was actually a professional athletics meeting, tossing the caber and doing the, uh, the old, all the, all the, he and, and the, Professionally, they've always done it in Scotland. It'd be handicapped. You'd be, not us, this is a special race, but the, the 100 metre runners, somebody might be doing 104 metres and somebody else only 98. It'd be staggered stars yeah. because that's where the handicap. Anyway, they invented this race, fastest footballer in Britain. And it was athletics, um, cutaway shorts. You'd have liked me like that, Chris. Uh, <laughs> cut away shorts, starting blocks, spikes, uh, electronic timing, tartan track, and it's a 100 metre race. And if there were more than so many entries, which you usually had two races, a qualifying race, and a, sometimes we had three. If there were more people, you'd qualify for the semi final. I've got a photograph at home. Uh, as an I'm, th there isn't no such thing as the tape, but because it's electronic time. Yeah. As I'm, quote, breasting the tape, there's, if you ever you look on an athletics track, there's lines, there's a line on that tape, then a metre, then a metre, there's all lines for five metres. Then there's a gap, and then there's a five metre gap. So again, you've got one, two, three, all metres. I've got a photograph of home of me breasting the electronic eye, and there's a lad just gone over that 10 meter line. So he's about nine meters behind me. Yeah. Malcolm McDonald. <laughs> okay. Who was well. considered to be a very, very fast runner. He, so, he came fourth. Unbelievable. So you were the, you were the Usain Bolt of 70s footballers. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, there's not many pitches 100 meters long. So uh, <laughs> I took 96 meters to get warmed up. <laughs> but it's a great thing because you won it seven years seven. in a row, didn't you? I would have won it the eighth time, I think. But uh, 
in in those days, the last time last time I went, it was eight hundred and fifty pound prize money, late seventies. You know, a lot of money. And they phoned up to say because it's a professional meeting, people bet on it. They phoned up to say, "Are you coming?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "Well, we don't want you to. Why not? Nobody's betting on the race. They all see it a <laughs> foregone conclusion." I said, "Well, I'm still coming for the prize money." He said. If we send you the money, will you not come? <laughs> so I stayed at home. <laughs> I was getting a bit older anyway. <laughs> so I may have won it eight times, but anyway, I won it seven. We're going to have so much more from Steve Kindon, all available on our full podcast, available to download from all the usual places. We'll also find out just how um, Steve got mentioned on Desert Island Discs. Uh which is a truth and we'll talk a little bit more about your playing career at Molyneux as well and we're going to have a fabulous story about Derek Dugan hopefully <laughs> that you'll be able to listen to on our full podcast for the time being thank you very much for watching make sure to download that podcast and thanks for being with us on the Old Gold Club The Old Gold Club powered by Wolverhampton Building Supplies with Mikey Burrows and Chris Iwalumo.